Hello to everyone who's out there. Hopefully there's people online and can hear me at the moment. Uh, my name is Tom Draffin. I'm from the uh, Virtual Cropping Group. I'm the Senior Manager of Extension Communication. And uh, today we're bringing you a Harvester Discussion Forum where we'll be uh, joined by some key industry personnel and some of the uh, Blue Mallee growers to talk about harvest losses, harvest weed seed control and reducing harvest of fires in this year. This project is um, on the back of a GRDC investment, which was around how to set up clinics, um, which were gonna be happening this year, but unfortunately due to the coronavirus pandemic and the restrictions imposed by that, we have to change the program a little bit and offer what we can in Victoria online um, with face-to-face -face clinics happening across Australia in the different regions of GRDC uh, outside of Victoria. So this is just an opportunity to to have a conversation or to, to have a think about some of the strategies you're going to use this year and some of the options for measuring your losses and harvest weed seed control. So we're joined today by Marcel Cringe, who's from Manitoba in Western Canada. He's the founder of Bushel Plus and he's joined in the background, if you can see him in the dark, by his uh, co-director of Bushel Plus, Chris, who will be uh, joining in if necessary. We've got Pete Newman from Plant Farm in WA. Pete is a harvest loss specialist and he's got around 25 years worth of experience in, uh, in this sort of stuff. And he's based in Geraldton, WA. Joining him in WA is Ben White from Condinian Group. Ben's been working with Condinian Group for 20 years or so and he's been involved in a huge amount of projects looking at harvest of fires, reducing harvest of loss and harvest uh, uh, weed seed control as well. And our growers today are Cam Taylor from Lubeck, Ian Rewalt, who's from the Wimmera and Ben Merritt who's from Ultima, so north uh, of Birchip. So I'm gonna hand over straight to Peter Newman, who's gonna give, some, uh, give a little presentation about some of the harvest loss stories that he's been, uh, he knows of and, and, and projects he's worked with. So I'll hand over to you, Peter, how you going? Yeah, good, thanks, Tom. Thanks for the introduction. Great to have a lot of you joining us. I can see that we've got 50 odd people out there, so that's great. Look, I thought we, we thought today would be starting it would be a good place to start on harvested losses um, because uh, if we that sort of is the why of why harvest setup is important. So harvest setup is all about capacity with minimal losses, and so we thought we might start with the losses and then move on to some of the other setup and harvest weed seed control things later. So I'll just uh, share my screen here um, and tell you a bit of a story about uh, a project that I did with GRDC. Get that out of the road so I can see it. Tom, you let me know if everything's going well there. Should have counting canola on the screen. So I had a project with GRDC um, over the last few years. It started with a farmer in the region here. He was harvesting canola. He would put his header in. This is eight years ago. He put his harvester into crop of canola. Uh, it was going two tonnes per hectare. He was pretty happy. And then he threw out some trays and discovered that his crop was actually going 2.4 tonnes per hectare. So he was throwing 400 kilograms of canola at the back of his harvester and had absolutely no idea. That farmer then went on to build his own drop trays with electromagnets. Would have been a good business opportunity, Marcel, but we missed it. <laughs> and fortunately, someone else picked up on it and started making um, drop trays with uh, electromagnets. So in the photo there is a Shergain drop tray. I purchased two of those with some GRDC funds, ran a project for two years, shared those drop trays. I set up a couple of kits here of drop trays and everything that was needed to go with them and shared them between farmers. And the, far the idea was the farmers used the drop trays, measured their losses and shared their stories on a Twitter handle called at Harvest Loss. Then Marcel turned up. Uh, we went and had a look at the ideal harvester one day and brought his drop trays with him, the Bushel Plus drop trays, uh, and, uh, and you know, a couple of different versions, the small version, the, the wider version, and in this case, dropping it from the front, the previous one was dropping it from the rear axle of the harvester, and then using his separator there that you can see that little bucket has a fan in the bottom of it, so it makes the job really quick and easy, and uh, learn a fair bit from Marcel in the process, and also kept using the Shergain drop trays uh, with lots of sieving and so on to measure some losses. Another photo of Marcel, another development of his. He'll probably tell you more about these, but these are little mini drop trays that they use for measuring losses under chaff decks in Australia. And there it is there, mounted to a chaff deck. So part of the project also involved me developing a harvest loss calculator. 
it's on the GRDC website. Um, I know Bushel Plus also have their own app, and um, and we both we do the maths slightly differently, but we end up in the ballpark. And Marcel and I have just been talking a bit more about it recently about how to get these harvest loss apps and and uh, Excel spreadsheets really lining up. So that's a resource that people can use, and they can this particular one here can be used with any drop tray. You just have to put the dimensions in, and that's a quick look at. What it looks like, not a very attractive looking uh, spreadsheet, I might add, but um, it does the trick. So today I just thought we'd kick off with a few stories from this project and a few stories of harvest loss. And then I'm going to hand over to Marcel. He's going to tell us some more stories and, and a little bit more about how to measure harvest losses. So here's a story of a farmer. He borrowed the drop tray. It was a Sunday. He was harvesting canola. His first test is at Morrowa. I think the crop was going about 1.5 tonnes per hectare. His first test, he was losing 286 kilograms per hectare of canola. Had no idea he was losing that much out the back of his harvester. Changed the fan right down and got the losses down to 91 and then brought the fan up a little bit and got the losses down to 72 kilos per hectare, which I think is about, is that two percent? No, that's 5%. Oh, how's my maths? Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, that's, what's that, 4%? <laughs> anyway, he got the losses down to 72 kilos per hectare just by changing the fan in the cab in this situation, and he stopped there. I sort of suggested to him that he could have gone a bit further and maybe got the losses even further, but he was, he was happy at that level. But he saved $58,000 um, just by changing the fan in the cab. Another farmer borrowed the trays um, there at Mullawa, two harvesters, um, headers we call them in Australia, Marcel, I know that's what they call the front in Canada, um, but uh, two harvesters, the father and son team, so the son measured his harvester, John Deere harvesters, older machines, uh, and was losing 40 kilograms per hectare of canola, and then they thought, oh, we'll just quickly test the, the dad's harvester, and turns out that was losing 200 kilos per hectare and discovered that one of the key differences in the setup was just the fan. They adjusted the fan, made a couple of other minor tweaks and got that machine down to 40 kilos per hectare as well. So two harvesters in the same paddock, big difference in losses and no idea about it. Uh, then went and had a look at a class harvester, uh, another local fella here, tested his machine and, and it was doing a beautiful job. So at 11 tonnes per hour, he's only losing 20 kilos per hectare of canola. And this crop was going anywhere from 1.5 to 3 tonnes per hectare in some heavy patches. And then he pushed the handle forward and really upped the capacity and, uh, and increased it to 20 tonnes per hour of harvest capacity. And his losses went up to 60 kilos per hectare. And interestingly, the most economical option of these two is test two there with the higher losses. This is something I've learned a lot from Rod Gribble talking about it's not all about low losses, it's about the total cost of harvest. So if you have to slow down to get your losses down, then it can it does increase your cost of harvest and you need to find that sweet spot between losses and capacity. Uh, one more, I think, or a couple more quick ones. This is a farmer at Bajangara who was um, harvesting, making, he was picking up swaths, canola, about 1.8 tonne per hectare canola and um, putting it into narrow windrows for burning. Um, test one, he was losing 180 kilos per hectare. Marcel actually sat in the cab with this guy well into the night time trying to get this machine set up. Did lots of tests, lots of different things and got it down to 70 kilos per hectare. One of the issues here was um, they, because they were making windrows, they didn't have the, um, the, the spinners on or choppers on and there was just none of that sort of air movement, that suction off the sieves. And, and the sieves were overloading. It was very hard to get the losses down while making narrow wind rows. This is one of my favourites. This is a young fella who put this on Twitter. He's uh, harvesting some barley. He's losing 500 kilos per hectare of barley. And he got it down to 156 kilos by changing the fan speed. And he sort of said to me, that's 4.5%. Is that acceptable? And I replied, no, you should be able to get well below that. Keep trying. Uh, and he did. And he eventually got it down to something like 20 or 30 kilograms per hectare of loss. So amazing story that he was losing 500 kilos per hectare of barley and didn't have any idea that he was losing that much grain because he just couldn't see it. 
uh, turned out that his concave wasn't calibrated properly. So what it read in the cab was different to what was actually happening down at the concave. So once they calibrated that, focus on their setup, they got the losses right there. Other interesting thing about this story is he started harvest with the same settings that he finished harvest last year. So then he said, God, how much grain did I lose last year? So um, just to wrap up, there's a, a good story in ground cover on this about uh, harvest loss done by Joe Forward. So there's some of these case studies in there and some of the things that I learnt along the way. So one, looking on the ground is a waste of time. This is Mick Fells made this sheet up. He put a certain amount of canola on a photocopier and photocopied it and worked out that that is 100 kilos per hectare of losses, that much canola there. So he looks at the ground and, and says that, you know, if I, as long as the ground has less canola than that, I know that I'm under 100. Um, and personally, I don't think that we can see it on the ground. I don't agree with that. I think looking on the ground is a waste of time. If Marcel agrees later on, they all work. All the different colours of harvested work. Uh, it's all about settings and setup. I think the class, to be honest, was the, the king of harvesting canola. Um, it really did seem to be able to um, have maximum capacity with low losses. However, if they're set up well and they're driven to their right capacity, they can all work. Uh, as I mentioned, Rod Gribble has his app. He's got Harvest Calc, a different system where you throw a tray and use the Harvest Calc app to look at the total cost of harvest. So look at the cost of running the harvester and the, and the cost of the losses and adding the two together. So it's not just about low losses. Uh, measuring the mode that you are harvesting in. If you are making chaff lines, you harvest, you measure in chaff line mode. If you're making windrows, you're measuring windrow mode. If you're chopping and spread, you're measuring that mode. Some of the sellers of trays, some of the trays say that you should put it in windrow mode so you capture everything and then you're measuring that and then and then you convert it back. But I think when you put it into windrow mode, you can change the airflow through the machine and uh, that can affect your losses in a big way. Particularly, I noticed that with the John Deere harvesters, they've got those uh, chopper with the fans on them and they can really... Um, uh, suck air off the sieve. So you've got to you've got to keep the harvester in the mode that you're harvesting in. The other thing I'll say is measure one thing, change it, and measure, change one thing, and then measure again. You learn so much by measuring losses with these drop trays, and you learn a lot about harvester setup. And I think that we should measure twice a day, every day during harvest. Get your drivers involved so that they brag about minimal harvest losses at the pub rather than tons an hour. And calibrate your loss monitor. The farmer I started working with says. He reckons that loss monitors should measure in dollars per hectare. Um, they don't. If they did, it might wake a few people up a bit. But calibrate your loss monitor so with a drop tray so you know what it means. But that's all from me. And I think, um, I think Tom, I think the plan is now to hand straight to Marcel, is it? And then open it up to questions. Is that correct? Or do we want to have some questions now? No, uh, we'll pass on to Marcel. What we will say is that if uh, any of the growers listening or people on this uh, little forum are listening, just to post questions in the in the chat box as we go along, and uh, we'll do our best to to answer them through the through the presenters here. Uh, and if we can't get an answer to you today through the chat box, we'll, we'll follow it up if you uh, if, if we see something that we have to do some further research on for you. But yeah, we'll pass on to Marcel to talk a little bit about the Bushel Plus system and about measuring losses in his environment and what he's and his experience in the in the game. So Marcel, I think you're going to share a presentation as well, aren't you? Yes, I will be sharing my screen in a, in a minute as well. Thank you very much for having me. Honored to talk to everybody here today. It was a great uh, introduction here, some great examples, how things can, can work out in, the, in a paddock. And um, I think it will lead right into what we'll be talking about here now. Um, because one of, the, one of the main things here, just let me know once you see my screen here. Yep, we can see it myself. Well, I can anyway. There you go. Can you see the, the second slide there of the agenda? Yeah, man. Okay, right on. So we heard, we heard some great examples already, which I'm super stoked about. Good on you guys getting this program going and getting farmers involved and seeing what the bottom line 
uh, can be or how the bottom line can change because really this is what we found out over the years as well similar similar idea about hey can we make the harvest more efficient i get a bit more into the details here what we've been doing in the past um, what the research was showing and then what the bushel plus system and other systems on the market right now uh, can bring to the farmers can bring to the farmers harvest and one of the main things pete said it already you want to learn more about the whole harvester. It's, it's not just about buying a drop tray and dropping this tray a few times a day. It's really about look at it as a, an integrated system into your operation, where in the beginning you may spend a bit more time figuring out the trays, figuring out how to measure it and where to measure it. But as you do it more and more, you get so much quicker at it. And with the right system that gives you all the tools that make it quick and easy, you, you will like to use it because you realize how you, well, first of all, learn more about your machine and then make your harvest more efficient and then save that money. So that means next week, next month, next year, you are that much quicker at it. You have already created benchmarks of machine settings that worked, of nodes that worked well. Um, you know, those are, things, those are things that you can learn along the way. So it's not just a trade that you throw, it's really a system to learn more about your machine, what this is all about. So today we're looking a bit at um, why measurement, why loss measurements are Im important. Um, the whole calibration, I always compare it to our air seeders here. Um, how and where to measure, we get the growers involved a bit and then we go through a couple calculators in our new Bushel Plus app that we um, just redesigned for the Australian market. And Pete already talked about his GRDC calculator, which is awesome. And for all of this today, I really invite everybody to think outside the box with us here. If you have questions, shoot them in the chat box. Um, we get the growers involved. It's, it's not a black and white thing. There's so many different um, things out there. There's different colors of machines, different crops. I just checked the chat box here for a second because it keeps popping up. If it's sharp here, you can't hear me, just let me know, Tom. Um, yeah, so... Um, why is loss measurements important? And here comes the first fun part that my slides already messed up. Here we go. This is the one I'm looking at. I want to show you guys. So why is loss measurements important? It's all about your, your ROI on the farm. You've been growing the crop all year. You've bought the best seed. You've got the agronomists involved. Peter, uh, Nooms, how much time do we spend on perfect timing on herbicides, fungicides, right? All these high input costs. At time of harvest, the crop is there, we put all the hard work into this, and now we only have one chance to harvest. A smart farmer told me once, older fellow, he said, you can repeat everything in farming, but harvesting. You can reseed it again, you can respray it, but harvesting you can only do once. And that's what bugged me at working as an agronomist. You know, we all work our butts off in the spring and summer getting that crop to a point, and then at harvest we realize we might be throwing a lot of percent out the back. So um, the GRDC harvest loss program from Pete um, estimated about $98 million of canola could be lost out of the back of harvesters in Western Australia. Um, went out with trays to kind of prove and, and see how, how this would go. And if the numbers line up, if you go back in the past a little bit into Canada here, um, University of Manitoba, there's Rob Golden, who finished the study in 2012 and did a three-year continuous research on a canola harvest loss study. So they researched over 310 fields in three provinces in Western Canada, and they were checking combine harvest loss, and um, they, were, they were looking at all sorts of different um, factors as in um, plant stands and whatever else, they variety, straight cut, swathing, but overall, they kept saying, you know, our losses are still too high. So they found 2.3 to over 11% of loss um, throughout all these fields. And this was one of those eye openers where people were, were realizing, okay, there is more on the bottom line. And the Canola Council of Canada has teamed up with PAMI. There's our Prairie Agricultural Machinery Institute. They do a lot of research for combine companies, for the military, independent research. Um, they have done two programs already that found similar results in harvest losses. Um, precision planting in the U.S. has used our systems as well last year for corn and soybeans for 
um, for harvester losses. And there's lots of research out there that shows that there is still uh, money to save. And what I want to show with these here, they all have one thing in common. And that pretty much is that if we can't measure or if we don't measure it, we can't manage it. It's just like those examples from Pete Newman. They showed, you know, we could be harvesting and throwing 400 kilos out the back, but if we don't measure, if we don't double check, um, we really wouldn't know. Um, so and it's not just about the loss. We have the loss that we are losing in our profits, but then we're also putting seed back in the ground. And depending where you farm, depending on your crop rotation, those volunteer crops can be quite the pain. Um, a couple of countries that I visited for, for our um, harvest loss projects or throughout my times in university, the volunteer crops were actually the, the worst issue later on. Yes, I lost my ROI at harvest, but then next year I'm spending more time and money on spraying costs and chemical costs to get that volunteer crop out of my next crop again. And um, I think if we look back into seeding, if we, before harvesting, if you even talk about the seeding and then put it in perspective, and we say, I, I'm just, I, I, I think that we all agree that in the springtime or fall time, depending where, where you guys are located, when you seed, we all calibrate our air seeders and planters when we switch from barley to canola. And how, how are we doing this? Um, are we putting the seed and the fertilizer in the tanks? And then we're pushing the calibration button or we crank the handle on the cart and then we let all the seed and the fertilizer run onto the ground on two big piles and then we look at the pile and we say oh yeah boys that's about 50 kilos let's go seed right that's nobody really is doing it that way right people when i bring these examples up people look at me and say i yeah, know for sure we're not doing it that way we measure it we we weigh it we put it on the scale we know exactly how many kilograms per hectare we're seeding, we know exactly how many kernels per hectare are supposed to come up. So we're not looking on the ground, we're weighing it. So my philosophy of this whole thing is why don't we apply this to harvest where we're actually reaping the benefits um, of, of the year. And um, that leads right into what we hear a lot in comparison out there and what we see a lot in the field. And a um, couple of examples here. Um, Things we hear a lot in the past, eh? we don't need a pan for cereals or pulses. You know, I can see the kernels on the ground. It's pretty easy. We can judge it, can know what's going on. Quality checks of the grain. It's easy to see from the cab. There's a window behind my seat. Um, so no worries, we're, we're good. But then the agronomist comes out and starts throwing trays just as a hobby. In this case, it was Marcel, because I was just nuts for harvesting. And I just went out and started throwing trays. And then we found out that we had some eye-opening experiences uh, side by side. And one of those experiences, um, um, Scott out of, out of Western Australia, he was running a chaff cart, started using our system and um, got into it. And after a while he, he was realizing he could reduce his losses under about um, 1%. But what he was doing, he, dro he dropped the tray and then he started digging beside the trays or scratching on the ground to kind of compare how he used to do things in the past and how he's doing it now. So when he scratched on the ground, he looked at it and he thought, oh, you know, this is how it looked. This is how I would have combined the last 20 years. It doesn't look too bad. So in my opinion, he says, we, we could keep going. But then he analyzed what was in the tray. He did the math on it and realized he's still over 5% loss overall. And he went back, his son's on the header usually, they went back and forth, they changed some settings and they got the losses down to under 1%. So he was still saving money as he went. And then what he was telling me, which I found it really interesting to hear it from a farmer, from a user, that he's looking now at uh, loss per hour. So we talked about percentage of loss per hectare, uh, tonnage per hour, but he's looking at loss per hour. He says, how many hundreds of dollars could I afford to lose per hour while I combine compared to spending 20 minutes, half an hour with a drop tray out in the field, reducing my losses, calibrating my loss sensors. And um, I find it really interesting to learn from you guys, from the farmers, to see what the experience is out there. And they come up with some great examples like that. I think that's a, it's a great way to look at it, loss per hour. What, what can I afford to, to actually do it that way? 
Um, great example from Esperance, the farmer told me, you know what, we're looking on the ground, but what we always look for is the thick and plump kernels on the ground. We don't really look for the broken kernels when we're looking on the ground and in the straw. And when we throw your tray, so when we drop your trays, um, we find broken kernels as well, and which is also our loss. But we found in the past, when we we're looking on the ground, we never really accounted for these broken ones. Or where we are from here in Manitoba, we got some pretty tough soil. So in the summer, they crack open. We have cracks and gaps sometimes this wide. So by the time you go there and you scratch on the ground, half the kernels that are thrown on the ground are already down down in the down in the soil so you won't even see these anymore um, so it's all about putting it in perspective quality check uh, bushel plus has a small shaker box where people where people can just take a hand sample out of their grain tank for example and throw it in that box shake it and you can see how many cracked kernels cracked or broken kernels you have in your in your sample and it kind of shows you um, or can tell you concave settings um, feeder house chain settings, what you're cracking here and there, or if you're running full returns and have cracked kernels again, we get into this a little bit here. So there's a lot of things from what we hear and what actually happens um, in, in the field. And then, as I said already in the past, we were also scratching on the ground and I worked in a, a lot of countries where, actually I worked in Russia on a quite large farm and you know after the third of fourth combine you were just full of dust you're in the dirt you all know how it is at harvest and it was just you always you always in the dust which is not good and the second thing it got too dangerous you run beside those large combines they're not getting any smaller they're not getting any slower so you're trying to run beside them throw a tray so safety became a large issue um, to the whole way of measuring for harvest loss and there's one great example from a trade show out of Washington that Chris, my business partner, went to, and the farmer comes up to him and he looks at it, reads remote control drop pan and thinks, that's what we need. I'll take one right now. And Chris says, do you want a demonstration? He goes, no, I, I know for sure we need this because my hired man, he lost an eye a couple of years ago checking losses. And what, what, what that farm was doing, they had a catch pan, like a plastic pan on a, on a long stick. And they would run beside the header behind the chaffer and would catch a sample and would pull back. And then as the hired man turned around and ran away, they actually the catch pan hit the ground and the stick hit the ground and he kept running and the stick went right up into his eye. And luckily the farmer said he was wearing safety glasses. Otherwise he would have probably been dead because he, he lost his eye, sadly enough. Um, but that just shows how quick things can happen at harvest. We had another farmer when I was still working for Cargill as an agronomist. The guy stood up at a meeting and said, you know, one of my, one of my um, neighbors actually got run over with, with the combine trying to throw a tray underneath. So it's not just our eye, it's also safety. We all want to come home safe to our families. Um, it's, it's an important thing these days. And like I said, those, those machines are not getting, they're not getting any smaller. Um, in the end of the day, or not even, not, yeah, not smaller, not, not slower. I'm kind of going through this a little bit faster, this slide here, because I think we're kind of getting the point of, we want to have the safety. The other thing too, compared to throwing a tray or looking on the ground, the nice part with those magnetic drop pans is you can keep measuring in the same spot. So you have the consistency of comparing now apples to apples. And it's not just, it's not just anymore trying to throw a tray and sift it through by hands and trying to blow the chaff out. Um, it's, it's, it's a timing thing now where the right system provides you with all the tools and it's quick and easy to do that. There's, um, there's different um, pans out there, for example, with the bushel plus, there's a, is a tray that's made for longer stubble conditions like straight cut canola that falls in between. So it's, it, it's something that should save you time as you're doing it. Um, so there's a couple of things about this, um, what you should look out for, um, when you're using these things, because as you can see, there's different spots where you can mount magnetic trays or man magnetic drop trays. We call the silver, uh, part here that you see, we actually call this the carrier because that is actually the piece that attaches with two permanent magnets 
onto the header or onto the header front, depending where you want to measure it. And then nested inside, you see this red drop tray. That's the tray that actually falls to the ground. But what happens here with this design is, as the combine is going, the red drop pan is actually covered. So that means that no kernels or chaff can enter the drop pan before you're actually testing. So um, we looked at a couple of pictures here prior, and uh, we'll see them later when the growers are talking about their farms where there's some bunch of grain on the axles. So you don't want that grain falling into the drop tray. So if you look for something out there, make sure you have a, something covered. You're looking for a covered design. And as you can see the drop tray there on the bottom right corner, um, it's, a, it's a tray that there's nothing inside. So it's a clean tray that when the chaff hits it, or when the straw hits it, there's no kernels that can bounce around. And you have the exact square meter area that all the kernels and chaff can actually go into. So there's no, there's no magnets or any mounting things in the way where kernels can bounce off of. Um, but like I said, there's different versions out there. So you got to make sure it works for your farm and for your situation. Um, we're just describing here what works in different scenarios. And um, we got a couple um, examples coming up here from the chaff lining and for the chaff decks, because that's something that's um, being heavily used in your areas, the way I understand. Um, regardless, of, regardless of which system you go for, if you build your own, look at it as an investment, as a cost per hectare, just like you're looking at your seed or um, your herbicide application. If you put it in perspective and you're looking at it, uh, you're buying metal, you're buying magnet, and you're buying an app, and you look at the cost, yeah, it, it, it takes some money to develop these things in, in, in a company, right? And um, on the other hand, you have to look at it not just as like a one-time cost, look at it as a cost per hectare. Run it across your entire farm over five years. We're talking cents per hectare investment, for something that can make you tens of thousands of dollars, even more um, in the long run. And um, um, Ian, if I, can, if I can put you on the spot here for a second, um, you're, running, you're running chaff decks, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Uh, so, yep. Yeah. yeah, and then you have, you have one of the, the Bushel Plus minis, I'll call it, with the bracket that attaches to the to the chaff yeah. decks? Yeah, that's correct. No, so it's, well, it's the only way I could really measure the chaff off there, but yeah, yep. So it will, if I can jump to this example here, um, it will, what Ian has is, is the chaff deck. I'm thinking everybody uh, knows what the chaff deck will, will look like. An interesting thing is the, where we here in Canada, we have, we, have either two, we have two things. We're either spreading everything, the chaff and the straw, through the chopper, or we're dropping everything in the windrow. The nice part with you guys in Australia is for the chaff lining and the chaff decks, it gives you the opportunity to figure out your rotor loss and your sieve loss separately from each other. So um, as you can see it here in the example, this is a screenshot out of our new um, chaff deck calculator that's going live in, in two days here in our app. As you can see in this example, in step one, we're suggesting to take a measurement from the rotor loss. So from the straw that's coming out the back of the machine out of the chopper. So from your rotor or your walkers. It's, it's, it's referenced as orange here. And as you can see, the, red, the two red trays are sitting either in the middle of the machine or on the side. And the reason for that is you want to measure away from the chaff line there. So you can either attach the carrier underneath the axle from the header or underneath the feeder house, or you can, uh, you can add it towards uh, or onto the header front. You may have to adjust some brackets there, uh, but the magnets will attach the header front as well, and you can remotely drop them from these positions. Um, the new system that we just released this year, you can also drop on from your smartphone. So it, it will, the carrier will actually communicate with the new Bushel Plus app and it will give, you can trigger it, you can make it drop and the app will actually tell you when and where the tray dropped. 
So it's another advantage from when you buy yourself or in dusty conditions, you kind of know when it actually came or when it came down off the machine. And then in the, in the second step, we then go ahead and measure within the chaff line that comes off the chaff deck. So you can measure on either side. Um, but now you're actually measuring the sieve loss, but you're also catching some of the rotor loss in, in, in this example here. And now going by the perfect world conditions now, um, if you do this at the same time, you drop one tray in the chaff line, you drop the other one for, for your rotor loss, you, you have your sieve and rotor loss together, combined, let's call it. You do minus the rotor loss, will then give you in a certain equation, the sieve loss and the rotor loss um, kind of split apart. And that will show you in Pete Newman's calculator, will show you the, the loss separately and together and in the app, in the app as well. So, um, and if we can get some examples from, from you guys in there, regardless if you use the, Ian uses the chaff deck and the other guys are going with the chaff lining the seat destruct there, what's, what's kind of the timing, Ian, that, that you for your area would look at when do you measure what, with, within a day? Like what time of day would trigger you to go for a measurement? Hey Marcel, with this chaff deck drop pan, you're using that really little drop pan that you developed. Are people then using that same small drop pan to measure rotor losses or do they sometimes use the bigger one for rotor losses and then just the small one uh, under the chaff deck? That, that is a good question. So um, for, for the, the, you are able to use the larger ones from the header front, so measure on the side or measure in the middle, that, that's fine. You would just have to choose the different tray size in the drop down. So you would just have to make sure when you measure the one and you measure the other, that you use the right drop down. The app right now is, the app right now is built that, both me measurements are happening with the small tray because mostly the customers purchase one system. Um, and that's why the app is defaulted right now to, to the small one, where in the chaff lining feature, you can still, you still have the drop down of, of changing the, the drop tray size in there. So similar to your calculator, the thing is just if you use, if you use a smaller tray, in the chaff line and the larger tray on the outside, you just have to be careful to do the math properly in two steps because you measured a different area of rotor loss once and a different area of rotor loss again. So as long as you put this in perspective and make them equal, that's fine. So it, you, you want to set this kind of up, you want to get used to the math a little bit before harvest, spend a few minutes on it. But once you got this dialed down and that new app feature is very intuitive. It has, um, has some icons in it and pictures kind of guides you through it. The, the app has also a guide attached to it. So it's, it's one button and there's a two page instructions that kind of walks you through it, how to do it. Um, so it's, it, it's a good question. So I guess Marcel, coming back to the original question and going around the growers, Ben, what, what stimulates you to do a measure when your losses? Uh, we only started measuring losses last year and um, yeah, we'll have to work on it a lot more this year, but we're getting too high a grain loss in um, barley, that's for sure. So. And Cam, moving on to you. Yeah, so I guess um, We've moved from system to system. So we've gone from narrow windrow burning to chaff lining to now having the destructors on. Um, narrow windrow burning, it was quite easy to get out and have a look at your losses because it's just all behind the header. Um, with the chaff lining, much as, much similar, but um, yeah, you are spreading your straw, so you just got to motor, uh, monitor that rotor loss a little bit more. Um, but now it's it's got a little bit harder to measure our losses. Um, we can we can um, put a flap in over the destructors, which which goes back to pretty much a narrow windrow, but 
but it is changing a little bit of the setup of the header. So we're sort of probably relying a lot on our uh, sensors inside the header to tell us what our losses are. With these, with these um, superstructure units or different different units that way, have you guys done um, uh, power stops and to see if the machine, if you can still kind of see things inside the machine, or is the machine already empty and most of the stuff is gone by the time the power stop is, has ended? Yeah, to be honest, Marcel, we haven't we haven't done a power stop yet. So yeah, we'll probably have to try and do something this year. And for yourself, what what would prompt you to do a measurement for your losses? Is it changing crops or is it just timing? What do you look? What do you really? What makes you sort of go? Oh, we, we should we should measure our losses now. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess we try and do it. You know, it started because every, it changes during the day, but at least now you're trying to check to see how machines running and. And if you get any funny things happening on the monitors, it's another good reason to look, but it's certainly much easier to do now that we can separate them quite well. And we can be finding that we're getting more losses over the rotor than through the chaffer, but um, yeah, so it's a good way to measure that. Marcel, what do you reckon? Is there anything that should, that should be prompting growers to, like, stick to do, to take a measurement from your, from your end? Good question. So it's really something that conditions change throughout the day. Obviously, when we're changing crops, big thing, no doubt about it, changing crops is, is, is the main trigger. But then even, even throughout the day, um, we're, we're doing it at the moment at two, three times a day is really what we're recommending. We have some growers that have the manpower that one guy can go around really quickly and, and do it. So there's some guys that do it here once every hour. And in my own opinion, two to three times a day is great because it does a couple of things for you. It, it, it makes you on track and you can recalibrate your loss sensor. Because the main thing behind this here is we don't want you to throw this tray every two minutes and have somebody tied up with that. We want you to do measurements and then calibrate your loss sensor that way. So you create yourself a benchmark of what the machine is putting out so you can trust that loss sensor a lot better so when you're dropping the tray let's say a couple of times to to get a good average of what's going on with the machine and you found out that when you lost monitor you guys run mostly case machines there if you if you put your sensitivity after you find all your settings you like them and the sample looks good you put the sensitivity of your loss sensor about so that's about in the high green and then you do your loss tests and then you figure out Let's just say relatively we're at 1.5% loss all the time when we're that high. That's what we like. Then you've just created yourself the benchmark that you know in the high green, we're putting roughly out 1.5% out the back. So now when my condition is changing, I can trust that loss sensor a lot better. But as the conditions change drastically, for example, at night or you get a heavy dew in or you start, you start in some tougher straw conditions, that's a trigger again to remeasure that and revisit that calibration of the loss sensor. Um, and it's not just the old style loss sensor, it's also the new ones and combines with um, like the, the autopilots, the self-setting machines, the new ones, it's even more important to set those is because if you, you still have to set your, your max speed and your loss sensitivity for these autopilots because that's how they get triggered and that's what they use as a benchmark for that computer. So let's say your, your benchmark of your loss sensor is, is way off, you could actually have a lot more capacity in that combine, but your combine thinks you're throwing out too much. Meanwhile, if you drop the tray, you find out you're losing very little, so then you can turn the sensitivity down and get the combine speed up through that. So, I spent quite a bit of time last weekend in a, in a few combines here with autopilot. And the main thing was on the weekend there, dropping the trays to figure out how to get more capacity out of the autopilots because the autopilots kept slowing down because the sensitivity wasn't adjusted properly to the capacity. So those new combines, they are super intelligent, but those sensors are only as good as we calibrate them. So that would kind of be the, the triggers that we see out in the field. 
I said, if I can share one more quick story. I remember that day that you and I were in the field with the Ideal Combine. It was in the Greenwich Flats, pretty close to the coast in Geraldton, and the farmer was harvesting with his class harvester. It was a five-ton wheat crop, and he was losing 70 kilograms per hectare, slightly above where you want to be, but not too bad. The sea breeze came in, and we checked again 15 minutes later, and it went to 270 kilograms per hectare. So that comment about conditions changing, uh, he knew that he was going to stop harvesting because it was getting a bit chewy and, and he thought he'd start losing some grain, but he was pretty blown away with just how much grain he did start losing very quickly. Yeah, that is a, that is a great example that once conditions change or your speed changes, but you keep the same <laughs> setting, your harvest should go up. So if you want to keep combining with a higher speed or in different conditions you got to do your testing and then you have to adjust your, your your settings for these conditions like over years and years a lot of times out here people were saying you know you got to slow down you got to slow down or you can only go a certain speed and that's true if you keep the same settings when you drive faster but now what we find out with our systems our customers come back and say after they got used to it now they can push the combine more and they, can, they, they realize what they can really do for tons per hour because now they have a system where they can quantify their loss with the higher capacity. But before you were guessing, you know, I remember my grandpa, you know, as soon as that combine went a little faster, the first thing he would start, you know, he would start, you can't drive that fast, you're losing way too much grain. And, and it's true if you keep your settings the same way, but if you try to push it and then change your settings accordingly to a higher crop flow through the feeder house, higher crop flow through the corn caves, more chaff, more material on the sieves, you adjust your wind speeds and the sieve because of we have more material going through the combine. You have to, to recalibrate everything basically for more crop flow go, going through. So so yeah, you can either you can do two ways. I'm getting off track here a little bit, but you can do it two ways. You can either determine, okay, we're stopping combining now because we're keeping the same settings and we're done or, okay, let's change the settings and see how far longer we can go. It's kind of the, kind of the idea behind that. Is, is that something that counts for, for, for you guys down there as well, Cam? Like at night is kind of a trigger for you when to stop combining? Uh, so we're, we're one that will change the settings. So like you can, <laughs> You notice it straight away in the morning. You've got a different setting. You get into the heat of the day when everything dries out a bit. Late afternoons, your best harvesting conditions. And then as soon as the sun goes down, you're, you're starting to change settings to adjust for rotor loss and, and um, yeah, different things. So making the harvester work a bit harder. We normally, we normally harvest in between the hours of about 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Uh, on a nice night, we might go a bit bit later, but generally we just get to a point where it's just uneconomical. We're going so slow and, and um, yeah, you can't control the losses. You just pull up. Rod Gribble, uh, I don't know if everyone knows who Rod is. He's the president of Australian Custom Harvesters. He's just put in the chat box here, Marcel. The good question is, why do people test? What would be the reasons why people would be not wouldn't be testing this, this stuff. Sorry, it was broken off there for a second. Can you say it again? I guess Rod Gribble has just asked why, why people don't test. Why don't growers test their losses? Is there reasons why they wouldn't be getting out and testing this because it's loss of productivity or? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we can kick that back to, to some of the farmers out there. But from my experience, what, what, what I've seen as an agronomist was um, mostly the rush you know thinking that it takes way too much time and that it's not easy um you know um just thinking it's a rush to get going or yeah so not realizing also the potential of it you know getting back to the is, sorry how long would it take to like, what's your average time to, to do to do a loss measurement test Oh, it takes about five minutes, yeah. Depends how far away you drive from the tray, yeah. 
Would you agree with that, Marcel? Yeah, we can do we can do it fairly. Like we're talking now one test, so I I always say I rather do a few because you want to get a good average. Like you you don't, don't want to drop a tray once and then say okay we had a good spot let's keep rocking. Uh, you, you should do a couple, especially if you're spreading your straw. You want to measure perfect scenario. You want to measure in the middle and on the sides to get a good average out of this. Um, so you don't want to fool yourself, right? But one test so when i say one test it's one drop getting out cleaning it putting into the app i was doing it on the weekend by myself i was sitting in the cab triggering triggering the pen on my cell phone go out clean it collect the tray put it back on the header and jump back in the cab and as i'm driving i'm doing my calculations that's definitely less than five minutes to do um the cool thing is if people really have two carriers so one on the axle one on the side you drop two trays at the same time, you sell you save a bit of time, or you drop one with the remote and the other one by hand beside the machine. You're under five minutes for sure for one test, but then again, you should do multiple and kind of go and really, one of, the, one of the really important things we haven't talked about yet is the whole pre-harvest setup about, I call it the three C's, you know? You want to calibrate your concaves, calibrate your sieves, and then at harvest, calibrate your loss sensors as, as you go. And, and those, those two calibrations pre-harvest can really save you a lot of headaches before harvest even starts. That's something we see out in the field a lot that people or dealers don't have that done before harvest. And that's something that's very, very important prior. So Rod's just hand up. So I'm just going to allow him to talk for a second myself. That's all right. Are you there, Rod? Yeah. Yeah, me, Marcel. Hey, yeah, Rod. How are you going? I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, you know that there's that been a debate around for many years about manufacturers have their um, SIP calibration, well, loss calibration sensors um, <clears throat> associated with ground speed. Basically, the faster you went, um, Okay, you had more loss, it, you didn't change anything, but um, the loss didn't show up as dramatic as what you thought it could be. Um, have you got any thoughts on that? So are, are you actually saying that they linked it in the software to the speed and they were supposed to pop up? Or are you saying as you go faster, you actually more kernels were fit hitting the sensor? Yep, there's been a, <clears throat> I've been a discussion for a while on this. A um, couple of manufacturers, one's a, one's a very large one, has their loss monitors associated with ground speed. I, I've never come across it. I don't know how you check it, um, but that's what I've been told. And that came from, I think, a, pro, a study from Palmy did that. Okay. Um, I have not heard that the manufacturing company linked the loss sensor to the speed sensor in the software. I would think that that is a, yeah, I've never, I never heard of it. The way I'm going about it, or we have been going about it in the past. I mean, I say we, it's my, my old custom harvesting bosses I used to work for in different countries is basically if you would go faster and we have higher losses on the sensor, we would recheck with the tray and if, it's, if the tray shows less than the sensor, we will then take the sensitivity of the sensor down again. So we basically make up for, um, for that higher sensor that was not showing the proper way. But I, I haven't heard that a manufacturer has done the whole speed with the loss sensor test. I, I wouldn't like that if somebody would do that, to be quite frank here, uh, but I haven't heard about it. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but um, seems to be you know virtually cheating the game, but that's what the claim is. Yeah. Ben, I, I hope. hope. And what that is? Unmute yourself, mate. I've never heard it. Ben might might know. Um, be pretty easy to test with the tray, right? Yeah, I would have thought it'd be easy to test. I've, I've not heard of it either, Rod. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a whole lot going on in the background of these machines now that we probably 
don't know a lot about. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Marcel, is there anything more you want to go on before we sort of wrap your part up and get on to Ben and talk a, bit, a little bit about a harvest of fires? Is there, is there any questions yet that were kind of thrown around? Uh... Not at this stage. There, uh, there, had a question about there is one. Um, there was a, a fellow, I think, in the chat, uh, rather than the questions section, saying that um, Simon's got an HSD coming next year and the testing mechanism for harvest losses involves fitting the rubber sheet over the HSD. Uh, and he's a bit nervous about that. Um, I mentioned that both Cam and Ben have HSDs. Uh, it's probably throw to you first, Ben. Have you um, tried testing with the rubber sheet over the HSD um, to test harvest losses? Uh, <clears throat> we, we had it set up in Winrow mode to calibrate losses once or twice, and we're also Winrowing straw behind the header but we never put the rubber sh shoot on the back. Um, so I've got no experience using it, but it, the crop flowed over the, um, uh, over the um, auger quite well. So you turned the auger off, turned the belt off and kept harvesting for a little while? Uh, I did it both ways. I had the belt off one time and I windrowed um, and I also had had the belt on, and both worked okay with with the back door off. Yeah. What about you, Cam? Have you tried it? Yeah, we um through we uh, had to bypass the destructor in some rentals. Um, so we put the rubber flap in, and um, you just disconnect the belt on the side and just leave it off the pulley. Um, it just that's the quickest way to do it we found otherwise you've got to take it all apart pretty much um but you just leave the belt sitting there tucked up or out of the way um and you just bypass it it's the there's just a few little clips and you've got to reverse one of the one of the things to fold around inside the back of the destructor but yeah if you if you practiced it before harvest it would take probably 10 minutes but in the middle of the paddock during harvest it probably took half an hour or something yeah, okay. I get. I appears to me something that could still use a bit of improvement. I guess the other question is um, the mills potentially draw a bit of air off the sieves and by putting a belt, turning them off and putting a belt over them could change the harvester settings a bit. Do you agree, Cam? Sorry, just repeat that. Pete, sorry, I just missed that. Well, when you turn the mills off, you know, they, the mills suck air. And so if you turn them off and they're no longer sucking air, will that change the settings much, do you think? Change the airflow over the sieves? We, we were always, yeah, like that was one of the major concerns that growers were talking about. Like they've got little air vents on the side of the destructors anyway. And we never, we never saw any sucking or anything going on or you go, up to the back of it we never found that so i'm not sure that that's such a major thing um but we had a high volume year so maybe yeah maybe in different crops it'll it'll perform differently but that's that wasn't a concern of ours thanks cam Marcel, do you want to, is there anything you want to finish up with from that? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just finish up here with my, with my app examples here. We're, like I said, we're just uh, releasing the next couple of days. It just gets uploaded to the app store at the moment here, our little Australia update for chaff line and uh, chaff tech calculators. We can see a couple of screenshots here that it's uh, pretty intuitive uh, with a couple of examples of where you measured and uh, what you found. Uh, with a couple of quick guides in there and I would like to finish with a comment of you know it, it really doesn't matter what kind of combine you're running a couple examples bottom right is our marketing video top right is our customer or sorry our neighbor in Russia when I used to work over there for a couple seasons so this is how they were harvesting on their farm you can see the crops in front of the header front and you know but even they were checking for the losses because they have to somehow quantify what's going in the tank, what's going out the back. Um, the new X9 machine, you know, still same thing. 
Uh, they have lost sensors and everything to be calibrated. Um, the, our system is in their marketing videos at the moment where the engineers are working on the new X9, take, uh, taking it through the field, calibrating everything. So it, it's really about setting the machine, learning more about it. And it's not about blaming the driver here. It's, we're not blaming the farmer, we're not blaming the driver. I like this example from Pete Newman, where the guys weren't, didn't realize that the concaves weren't properly calibrated. We had a customer here in Canada, the concaves, there was actually bolts, the frame on the side was broken, so the machine was spitting grain out the back. It, it's, it's not about blaming the driver, it's about setting up the machine properly and learning about um, the machine and learning your conditions. We got some tough conditions now in canola, where the canola stalks are so green, that we're actually squeezing some moisture out with tight concave settings and the kernels are actually sticking to that chaff and the, the sticky straw and going right out the back. It, you can't even see that on your lost sensor because the kernels are not physically hitting the sensor. The kernels are just sticking to the, the tacky chaff and straw and goes right out the back. So really, overall, um, I, we're hoping it looks like this in the future. You know, you wanna turn this air step right on and this is supposed to make you money in the future. Doesn't matter what you, what you use, you know, the, the vision is really making farmers more profitable. Um, we're farmers by heart, safety first. We wanna make sure people come home safe to their families again and making your farm more profitable. And um, that's what we're committed to. And love to hear this, this call for this. Good on you, Abel. thanks very much. Ben White from Continuity Group is going to give us a bit of a rundown on reducing harvest of fires this year because it is looking like it. There might be some uh, potential issues. Ben, is that right? Yeah, uh, certainly a, uh, a season um, much like we've had in the past that, that sort of points to the fact that we might have some potential issues uh, with harvest of fires this year. And it's got a lot to do with the amount of moisture we've had uh, over the past few months. So I'm just going to throw my screen up there. Um, can you see that okay? I just, I just wanted to quickly just touch on a couple of things uh, Marcel said, if I could, um, just uh, with regard to measurement of harvested front losses. Um, is that coming through all right there for you, Tom? Yeah, mate, I can see that fine. Yeah, great. So, um, yeah, I, I think one of the things we need to remember is that, uh, you know, when we're measuring harvest of front losses, we also really need to evaluate any pre-harvest losses and that needs to be deducted from some of the number, numbers we've got. And it's really difficult, I have to say, you know, Newham said before, scratching around on the dirt is, is, is difficult. Um, it's hard to find, um, you know, any, any uh, grains uh, amongst the soil, particularly canola, it's really tricky. And, and in canola, you can get quite a few harvest of front losses. So, um, you know, we've used some, some pretty low tech um, solutions in the past. Um, Oh, and that's just jumped to the next slide. But um, yeah, we've used some pretty low tech solutions in the past. And you can see um, Mark Saunders, uh, Mark one of my colleagues here, uh, carting some 16 mil ply in uh, just as the harvester went past. We threw those down on the ground. We knew what uh, what losses we already had um, uh, on the ground. We'd done some some uh, a pre eval, um, and we just randomly pushed those across the the the, the um, width of the front. So. Just, yeah, I suppose there's a, there's a low tech solution. And I suppose that Marcel, one of the things that yeah, we probably um, should have mentioned there was that that, that, that pre-harvest um, that pre -harvest losses just need to be uh, taken into account when we're trying to measure harvest of front losses. So, um, Ooh, but look, sure. um, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, talking about harvest of fires, um, and yes, that, uh, that harvest there is a harvest of, uh, on our family farm for about 10 years ago. Um, we did lose one, hence my interest in, in harvester fires from that point forward. The reason I say that um, I think that uh, we need to be pretty vigilant this year is that um, if we think about the last year that we had uh, really uh, high prevalence of, of harvester fires, probably 2016 is a really wet year. There's a lot of mold uh, and dust around uh, and the seasonal conditions absolutely play in, uh, or have an influence on, uh, on harvest of fires and, and, uh, and, and how badly, uh, how bad they can be in a particular uh, season. Um, next slide, we did a, a, a survey of uh, over 300 farmers. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a range of, uh, 
uh, of fires there in varying degrees of, of seriousness. Um, the black ones are complete losses. Um, I suppose the message here is is that you know this this took in account uh, that 2016 year uh, that that was really that was really wet. Um, and uh, there was uh, high biomass around a lot of mould. And, and again, I'll say to you, that's sort of the, the sort of season that we're looking at um, now. Uh, in terms of, whoa, in terms of what, uh, in terms of what crops we need to be careful of, obviously lentils, um, we've got some real issues with them. Lentils and cereals, uh, a pretty major problem, um, uh, particularly in SA and Vic. And as you can see, you know, other, other crops, you know, it's really the, the pulses are, are, are tricky uh, that, that, uh, that survey indicated that, that lentils uh, for SA and Vic were particularly problematic. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, weed seed mills, and uh, and I think one of the problems is they create a lot of dust. Uh, dust is a real issue when it comes to fires, and we need to make sure that um, uh, that we're we're managing that, and that mean might mean some more regular clean downs if we're running a mill at the same time uh, as we're harvesting. And, and I think. Um, you know, that might mean that, uh, you know, the frequency of blowdowns need to increase. Uh, certainly inspections need to increase. And we need to make sure that, uh, uh, that we're staying on top of uh, harvester hygiene. Uh, that survey, just having a quick look at uh, what farmers told us were the, were the cause of, of fires. Um, uh, as you can see, dust and trash build up. I've got a few slides jumping around here. Uh, dust and trash build up was the major issue there. Um, uh, bearing failure was also quite high, and there's a, a few things we can do about those two in particular. Uh, Blowdown, uh, I can't stress the importance of uh, good, good hygiene on a harvester. Start at the top and, and towards the front and, and move your way back and down. Uh, air lancers work really well. Uh, we've had guys using uh, uh, those little uh, um, battery powered leaf blowers, carry them around in the cab, use those to blow the machine down. Uh, in between a, a more serious uh, clean. Um, so I'd recommend one of those. They're, they're pretty light, easy. You don't have to have uh, petrol fumes in the cab from one of the petrol powered leaf blowers. The little uh, compact ones work quite well. Um, just really focus on, on areas where, uh, you know, there's high, uh, high buildup of material and, and uh, you know, around the front um, shouldn't be discounted. Anywhere where there's a lot of moving parts, bearings, oil um, leaks in particular can be, can be problematic. So just um, try and stay on top of those uh, from a hygiene perspective. The other thing I'd recommend people do if they haven't got one is um, using an infrared thermometer. Um, and I'd be interested to hear from any of the, um, the farmers on the panel today whether they're actually using one of these. It's a, it's a great thing to, to use. Uh, just keep a log of, uh, of bearing temperatures. You'll get an idea as to when, they, um, when they're gonna fail. Um, that, the failure is pretty rapid, so you need to you know, you keep an eye on things. Uh, make sure that, uh, that uh, you know, if bearing temperatures do tend to or start to rise pretty rapidly that you um, replace it pretty promptly. Um, and look, you know, different bearings will run at different temperatures. So there's no hard and fast rule as to, you know, what temp you should uh, be looking to, uh, to replace a bearing at. Uh, fire suppression, or oh, these knockout bombs, just be a little bit careful with them. Yep, some people um, zip tie these into the engine bay. Uh, they uh, come in a couple of different sizes, um, but do just be careful because uh, they do, they do uh, tend to uh, explode. Uh, that's, that's their mode of operation. So you don't want to be anywhere near one of those. If you're going to get out and inspect where, where there might be a fire, um, you might want to uh, just be a little bit cautious if you've got one of these in the engine bay and, and potentially, you know, not, you're not, you don't want that to be going off while you're up there um, searching around, so. And just a quick question come in from uh, the audience. Sure. How should, we, should you be checking your bearing temps? Is it, is your daily grease popping enough or? Yeah, well, obviously you need to be doing it when, uh, you know, after you've got, a, you've got the machine warmed up and you've done a couple of runs. I, I'd suggest, um, you know, after, at least a, after a box full, um, and then, you know, if you pull up for, for lunch or whatever, you know, uh, do it then again. You, there'll be opportunities, I suppose, uh, Tom, and, and you probably get a feel for whether there's, you know, potentially a bearing that, that you need to keep an eye on a little bit more uh, than another. So, so perhaps um, yeah, it, probably a little bit of horses for courses, but, but every opportunity you get really. And, and of course, be careful if you open up the side, the machine's still running, you know, be a little bit cautious that, uh, you know, you're not exposing yourself to moving parts, etc. Um, in terms of extinguishers, just be a little bit careful. Uh, the uh, the powder-based extinguishers uh, 
they can settle, and so make sure you're rotating these. That's the AB and AB, oh, sorry, the BE and ABE uh, extinguishers. Just make sure you're rotating those. Make sure that that dust hasn't settled and, and become hard as a rock. Um, and I also recommend always carrying, uh, you know, both water and a, and an ABE uh, on the front. Uh, down near the, near the steps of the, of the harvester and then sort of uh, towards the rear as well in case there's something going on in the engine bay that you need to take care of. Obviously the water there is, uh, is for any um, uh, subtle fires that you might get um, and then the, the powder uh, to look after anything electrical or, or, uh, or flammable. Uh, think about uh, your, 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 your operation and, and uh, the the direction of harvest, uh, you know, particularly in a in a fire prone crop, harvest into the uh, uh, into the crop with the with the prevailing wind blowing across the crop towards you. Um, and that way, if there is a fire, um, it's not going to blow into the crop. And look, just one other tip uh, I've got for, for anyone operating um, a machine that's, that's uh, maybe got a few hours under the belt, um, just make sure those concave access doors are really well sealed. And one of the issues we've seen is that um, you can actually have uh, a fair bit of dust ex escape outside those concave doors. And of course that pushes right up over the exhaust typically. And, and um, then you get injuries drop down off the exhaust into piles of chaff and, and dust around the machine. Uh, and that's where we see a lot of fires sort of spring up. Um, a couple of uh, quick thermography shots. This is just uh, to give you an indication of, uh, of what you can expect uh, using some of the uh, exhaust blankets and, and ceramic coatings you can see a significant uh, reduction in, in, in temperatures. Um, uh, for comparison's sake, you know that that same pipe, uh, that exhaust uh, section was running at, at, at over 200 degrees prior to the application uh, of that uh, of those of both the ceramics and the in the exhaust wrap. So, you know that can make a difference, and there's there's quite a few growers around that have put those in play. Um, couple of issues obviously with the wrap is that it will trap a bit, bit of dust. So, you know, that in combination with ceramics uh, is, uh, is a good option. And look, I, I will add that, you know, there, there are probably better options in terms of double skin exhaust systems and, and also um, uh, pressurized boxes for exhausts. That's, that, that they're used uh, occasionally in the, in the US and, and uh, uh, particularly in, in um, fire prone corn crops. Um, uh, they haven't really been tested in Australia, but uh, certainly something we're keen to look at. Uh, Tom, that's all I had on, uh, on fires and happy to take any, any questions. I just suppose we should ask the growers who are with us here, Ben, Ian and Cam, if they've ever had any issues with fire in their machines. Do you want to start off, Ben? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, last year on the Harrington Seed Destructor, we had a loose belt and it started a fire on the side. We had a tension too loose. Um, that was uh, probably experience from last year, but we were very vigilant with our blowing down probably five times a day and had a temperature gauge um, for the bearings and any moving parts. How far into the day's worth of... <clears throat> Were you when the Thank you, pardon. How far in were you when the fire started? How long into the day? Uh, uh, middle of the afternoon. Yep. High temperatures? Yeah, it wasn't too bad. Yeah, just got dealt with a fire extinguisher and yeah, smoked up a belt and sort of caught on fire. Yeah. Cam, yourself? Yeah, we had some fires, um, multiple. Uh, had had one in lentils that was probably the worst one. Um, so our we we found the destructors were causing a hell of a lot of fine dust. Um, we it was getting right up around the exhaust, and um, then some wires on the left hand side of the of the case was holding a fair bit of straw in there and um, and yeah, just dropping embers down onto that, which causing that fire to run along that left-hand side of the machine. We we were blowing down at least at least twice a day. Um, we, were, we had little handheld blowers um, with us at all times and we just blow down once, well, when we finish, so we start off the day clean and once at about dinner time. Um, so 
but if, if we're in lentils or beans, we had to blow down more times than that. Uh, just an indication is your air filter. We nearly had to blow that out twice a day. It was just, and that's not something that we've probably experienced. Running chaff lining and narrow windrow burning, uh, yeah, you're not getting any any dust and that type of stuff kicking around the machine as much as what we are now. So that's probably a major change for us. Um, um, so we've just changed to just to try and let material fall down on the left hand side of the machine. So just rearrange some wires. And we've also been uh, talking to some growers about um, getting uh, one of these ceramic coatings on one of the machines just to try it out. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, thanks, Ken. That's uh, that's interesting. In fact, there's a couple of um, a couple of approaches from a dealer level. And I know one in, in Queensland uh, is actually using, you know, applying ceramics as a, as a standard fit now for anyone uh, who's operating in uh, fire prone crops. And it's the same thing in South Australia as well. They're actually gone. They've gone down the double skin um, route uh, just because that's a, they found that to be the most effective uh, in lentils uh, for them. So. Um, yeah, there's a few different approaches. Ian, what about yourself? Uh, any any issues uh, from from a fire perspective for you? Oh, you just uh, you just need to unmute there, Ian. Okay, sorry about that. Yes, yeah. uh, in our previous combine, a 7120, we had lots of issues with that, but the later ones seem to be a lot better. Uh, the other one caused lots of trouble in lentils. But um, the next one we moved on, we've actually got a fire suppression system on it as well. Right. Um, but also experimented last year with where their air, air intake for the radiator uh, put a shroud around that, so a bit like a John Deere, where so it draws the air a lot higher up. Yep. And uh, that does make a difference. Um, we actually used to get another ten hours out of the air, out of the air cleaner by yep. doing that. Yeah, over a period of time. So I, I do wonder if that would be a, a useful thing, but it probably needs to be designed better than what I did. But it, it did work. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I've seen a, there's a couple of aftermarket versions um, that. I think um, a couple of copies are, are making and marketing, which uh, tend to work quite well. And you're right, they're just pulling air from that little bit higher um, mm. and and uh, and obviously a little bit less dust, which is uh, making all the difference for them. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's definitely another option in terms of trying to get clean air across the engine. Yeah, true. Yeah. So, yeah, between that and yeah, so that sort of reduced our risk of it. But, um, yeah, lentils are certainly the worst. We tend to find in lentils we just run, run, don't run ahead of the quarters hard, keep the temperature yep. down to a you know, slower, slower rate back under seventy percent. Yeah. So Graham, Graham Quick, who uh, who did a lot of testing with um, various crops, um, found lentils to be five times more flammable than uh, than uh, say a cereal, for example. So, uh, and you know, and the ignition temperature is much lower as well. So, um, yeah, there's uh, there's certainly to be treated with caution, and, and uh, you know, anyone who's growing lentils, I know that they, they, they know that uh, it's not something they need to take a little bit of care with, and, and certainly monitor conditions, and, and uh, yeah, and, and make sure that hygiene's top notch. Mm, true. Very good. That's, you, that's it from me. We want to start talking a bit more about our harvest weed seed control strategies and different methods now, seeing as uh, we know that there's, there's sure. people out there. Newms, I'll let you um, take the lead on that if you'd like and uh, follow through with uh, a bit of info on the various systems if you like. Sounds good, Ben. If you just stop sharing your screen, I'll share mine yep. and we'll uh, get into that. Right. Uh, here we are here. Okay, so I, um, I probably have too many slides here, so I'm going to make a start with um, just a bit of a summary of some of the harvest weed seed control mills. I'll start with the mills. And then I think I'm gonna to throw to you, Ben, as you've got a few slides on comparing the mills. And then we'll, um, when we talk, then we've got two growers, Ben and Cam, who have mills, uh, HSD mills. We'll talk to them about those. And then we'll move on to some of the other harvest weed seed control tools. So um, quickly, we've got these three main mills. There's a fourth one as well, which I'll mention. Uh, the seed terminator, Ready Cop SCU and the IHSD now the vertical mills and look they are destroying 95 to 98 percent of the weed seeds that enter them so we're pretty confident with those numbers we're looking to get some more independent testing going testing these things is very tricky it's just not easy 
Uh, and so the companies, I think, have all done a great job of testing their mills and we're just looking to, to even make that a bit more rigorous uh, by using the same chaff, the same seed and exactly the same process. And But I'm sure that they're all going to come up trumps of being pretty high on the seed kill. Um, we started, well, we didn't start with the hydraulic HSD. Before this, there was a tow behind HSD. But I've just put up the hydraulic HSD and, uh, and then uh, that moved on to the the belt driven vertical HSD. So Harrington Sea Destructor has sort of gone through a bit of an evolution there from tow behind to hydraulic and now vertical and, and belt driven, which is what the growers that are with us today have. Uh, there's a picture of the rear with, uh, with the auger running between the two mills to, in case you haven't seen it. We also have seed terminate being belt driven. I guess the difference being that um, different mills, which we'll have a look at in a moment, but that they mounted horizontally, and so a, a gearbox that that turns uh, that that's involved in that to change the direction of the drive. Uh, and I've just I've got the hydraulic HSD there because just to show that Mike Walsh, some of the testing that he did in um, a few years ago, compared the hydraulic HSD with the seed terminator in the field where he was riding along the back of the harvester, and he had some air seeder hose feeding down into the top of the mills get them harvesting and then they would drop a known amount of dyed seed in, catch it with a sock and then uh, and test it that way. So that's one way these mills are tested and you can see the results there, the 95% on the hydraulic HSD, 99% on the seed terminator. There's been other static tests as well and giving pretty similar results. So if anything, the seed terminator seems to maybe have the edge on the others in terms of seed kill, but um, they're all up well into the 90s, it seems. Uh, we also have the ready cop has come to the market now. I know that Marnie's uh, joining us in the background today. If there's any questions, we might throw to you, Marnie, from ready cop. Um, the you know this is the a closer view of it here photo that I took. That's actually Beetle from uh, Primary Sales in the background there. We had a group of Americans come out. We went to Wongan Hills, had a look at it. Once again, a uh, uh, combination of belt and shaft uh, driving these. We've got a belt and we've got uh, two gearboxes underneath each mill uh, driving that. Great thing, um, I think, about these, and I don't want to spend too much time comparing the, uh, the difference between all these mills. Ben might have a bit more of a go at that, but um, they come often, they don't have to be, but um, teamed up with that Mav Chopper from Redicop. So a, a great sort of marriage there in my book because yeah, getting that even residue spread is an important part of what we're trying to achieve by destroying weed seeds and, and uh, spreading the residue back over the paddock. So there's the inner workings of the ready cop mill. So it's these sort of uh, vertical bars. So that's what is called the stators. So these three rows of stators that remain stationary. And within that you have two rows of rotors and, a, and some flails on the inside. Is a closer view of the uh, stators. You can see that one is just about worn through and these are designed to be flipped over and so you can wear out both sides and double the life of them with uh, some tungsten coating there. And there's, uh, from the ready cop point of view, that's uh, looking from the inside, looking out their um, sort of chopper blades they've got mounted in there. There's the first point of impact, hitting the seeds, throwing them into that first row of stators and then two rows of rotors. Now, each of the mills, those three have a similar process. So you've got the terminator on the top left there. They more have the, the screens, three rows of those screens, the ready cop at the bottom, and on the right, the HSD, which is also three rows of stator, but they're sort of more angled bars. And so all pretty similar to one another in, you could say in one sense, in that they all have the, the three rows of stators, the two rows of rotors and some flails on the, on the inside. Uh, and then uh, also just another sort of variation on that seed terminator have brought out what they call their high capacity mill. That dog is sitting in it there and that just has two rows of stators and that is uh, really aimed at um, if there are conditions where, where there might be blockages, so green sort of crops or, or uh, anywhere where the capacity of the harvester might be challenged you can swap out to those pretty quickly. It does reduce the kill rate of the weed seeds a bit, but if the show must go on, that, that's a good option. I, I really applaud Seed Terminator for this approach. I wonder if we might see it from the other companies as well, just as an option, maybe, maybe not, but um, yeah, as an option to keep the show on the road if, uh, if there are conditions at which there are blockages. 
Um, and then there's a fourth one um, that is being developed in Western Australia. The guys that make the Tech Farm Chaff Carts have also developed what's called the Weed Hog. Now, the, the Weed Hog is a completely different setup. So those other three, you could say, you know, are relatively similar sort of principles. The Weed Hog is this approach here. You've got these two big barrels with the sort of blades in them uh, and a void in between, and they rotate in opposite directions to one another. And, um, and the weed seeds sort of get hit from the path of one set of blades into the other and, to, and back to the other. So they're not as high a percent control so far as the other mills, um, but a cheaper option, they're looking at being only uh, 50 to $60,000 where the others are anywhere from 90 to $110,000 capital cost. So yeah, just a fourth option. They've had uh, one or two prototypes. I think last year they're building a few prototypes this year and uh, we'll see a bit more from those guys later on. And so just before I hand to you, Ben, I'll just point out that with all of these things, it's not just about the seed kill at the mill end, it's this equation. We've got to get the weed seeds in the front first and then we've got to keep them in the chaff stream and divert them into that tool and then we've got to kill them in whichever harvest weed seed control tool we're using. In this case, we're talking about the mills. So a typical equation here, if we've got a mill that does 98% control, you know, for ryegrass, for example, we might get 75% of the ryegrass that's in the field into the front. That's a pretty good result. That's around about average. If we do it really well, we can divert 95% of that ryegrass seed into one of the mills or whichever other tool. And then we kill 98%. So we end up with a total control of 70%. And the point being, if, if you did have a mill that is lower kill, like a weed hog or like a high capacity terminator, for example, it's not really like you drop from 98 to 90. You're sort of dropping from 70 to 64% total weed seed removal. So still a drop. Uh, and we do want to aim for the highest percent kill that we can. Um, but just goes to show that it's still worthwhile, uh, even if we have to compromise um, that we kill at the mill end of the deal. The other part of this equation is I just think that we've got a bit of room to move in improving those, getting how many weed seeds we get in the front and improving how many weed seeds we keep in the chaff stream, which is part of what our workshops will be about in the future. So I might hand to you there, Ben, are there questions that have come in? Uh, from there, we've got one. Um, does having a meal on your head or affect the warranty with the manufacturer of the machine? Um, the question. I don't fully know the answer. Um, uh, do maybe I'll throw to Ben and Ben first. And Cam, do you know anything about that? Uh, ben here. No, no, I'm not sure about that. Sorry. Cam, any comments? Uh, so we got all ours done through um, our local O'Connor's dealership in um, Horsham and it hasn't affected any of our warranty. So, but we got, we got everything fitted there in, in, uh, in the shop. So. We might see if Marnie can give us any answers on that. Peter, Marnie might be able to comment and Ben as well. So I'll stop sharing my screen. I might hand over to you, Ben, and... Um, and we'll talk a bit more about mills. You can uh, show us a little bit about what you know. You did a bit of a field trip last year or your last couple of years, haven't you? And gone and had a look at the different ones out there. Yeah, yeah, we've been and had a look, uh, Pete. Yeah, I suppose on just getting back to the um, to the warranty issue, I think um, in a lot of cases, uh, as you know, Ben and Cam have both mentioned, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, the, the mills are actually fitted by a dealership. Um, so they're supported uh, through that. I dare say that they've had the conversations with the respective manufacturers to, to make sure that, uh, you know, as long as everything's done correctly, that uh, warranty isn't affected. But look, that could vary from um, uh, from manufacturer to manufacturer, so it'll be worth checking. And yeah, I'll be interested to hear what Marnie's got to say about that uh, as well. Now, ben, if you want to speak, if, Marnie, can you? Yeah, let, yep, that'd be great. Let's, let's wrap that up, Marnie, if we could, please. Uh, yeah, well, we are, we're pretty good to go under the warranty side of things. Clearly, with the one brand, um, on the John Deere banner. Uh, the Deere SCU version through the factory is fully backed and supported under John Deere's warranty. Um, we adhere to John Deere's warranty guidelines, so the Redicop warranty fundamentally follows those same guidelines. So um, no issues there. I guess the reassurance with that comes the fact that they 
have ratified all the engineering all the way back so that you know they they are comfortable with the knowledge that we haven't compromised the harvester uh, on the John, Do John Deere side of things because the last thing we want to do is to have you know PDO gearbox unload or something like that so that's all well proven and to date no drums thanks very much money I appreciate that mate Good good no year. Thanks. thanks Marnie, that's great. Uh, so look, uh, just a, a quick comparison of, uh, of, the various, uh, of the various mills. We'll start with the vertical IHSD, which uh, as Pete mentioned, um, superseded the, uh, the hydraulic option and, and obviously gone, uh, gone vertical there. Look, this, these, these numbers and, and some of the data here is presented uh, as a result of uh, the work we did, uh, as Pete mentioned, at the start of the, this year. And I, and I would, I guess the caveat with that is that, uh, you know, some of the things might have changed, particularly uh, I know that uh, all manufacturers have been working pretty hard on, on, on the design of the gear and particularly the mills. So some of the mill costings may have, may have changed. So, um, so don't take this as gospel, take it as, a, as a, an indicative number. Um, but you can see there, you've got, uh, there's about, at the end of uh, last season, about 170 vertical uh, IHS, uh, HSDs uh, in operation around the country. Um, what uh, what do we like and, and what do we think maybe could be better on, on these particular um, machines? Um, high kill rates, um, easy to bypass the mill, and we've heard a little bit about that already. Um, uh, the drivetrain is really simple. Um, I guess the caveat is, and we've got it in the, what could be better, it'd be great to see uh, that, that belt removal um, or, or a dog clutch or something like that to make that a little bit, bit more simple. And I'm pretty sure that that uh, is in play from what I've heard. Uh, service and backup was, was uh, from all the manufacturers, uh, from all the um, farmer owners we spoke to said that the manufacturer was well supported uh, through Macintosh. Um, so that was, uh, that was pleasing to hear. Um, would, uh, would note that, you know, some steering angles can be limited uh, as a result of fitment um, and, uh, and there's no integration of the, of the ISO bus terminal um, for the controls uh, for, the, for the IHSD. Um, Look, again, I suppose uh, take these with a grain of salt because one of the things that uh, there's a lot of conversation about is, is just millware. And I think um, it's got a lot to do with uh, a, a huge number of variables, uh, a lot to do with the, the kind of country or how low you're cutting, how much sand or gravel you're putting through the, through the, the harvester and eventually through the mill. Um, you know, that sort of thing can wear mills out really quickly and prematurely in a lot of cases. So I've just got uh, one example for each just to give people a bit of an indication. But you know, again, uh, I'd be really interested uh, as I've, after I get through these, just to hear um, from Ben, Cam and Ian as to you know, what their experiences on, on, uh, on millware uh, has been. Um, across the Redicop SCU, we just heard from Marnie there before, um, yeah, uh, they are. Th those uh, the replacement uh, mill components are pretty expensive, but uh, as we mentioned before, they, they can be flipped, so you can get double the life out of them. Um, uh, compatibility with uh, with a three meter CDF system, which is important for some guys operating on those, um, with the addition of some ram collars, a steering ram collars. Um, uh, this is as of last year. There's about twenty in operation nationally, and I dare say um, Marty might uh, be able to update us on that. But I, I dare say there'll be quite a few more around. Uh, this next 12 months. Um, that's the same photo that, that uh, Newm's put up earlier. Uh, again, that one had done a, a lot of work and was ready to be flipped, um, but it just it does give you some indication of, of uh, what they look like once they've uh, been in action for a while. Um, and some pretty interesting um, uh, technology in terms of uh, surface coating applications here as well, which um, you can see have done their job in terms of uh, sustaining the life of those mills. Um, so as we run through uh, likes and dislikes, uh, for want of a better word, um, certainly uh, the integration of the of the of the Redicop is uh, very very neat uh, into the John Deere system. And I have to say, some aerial footage that we took um, uh, showed that the the SCU paired with a MAV uh, does a brilliant job of uh, of residue spread. Um, uh, that that uh, as Pete mentioned before is a, a really good. Uh, it's a really good marriage and it works really well. Bypass is very simple. Um, on these deer machines, you just slide it back out of the road and you can drop everything down. Um, mills are flippable, as we've mentioned. Um, I suppose it would be great to see, you know, there have been some ryegrass figures released, I should add, and, and that's written there as a what could be better feature. Um, 
uh, those da those that data has been updated. Um, I'd, it would be great to see some. Uh, I think there's, a, there's an issue with Australian ryegrass versus some overseas ryegrass, but I, I understand that's uh, that's in play as well. So we'll be able to do uh, some direct comparison. I know Pete Newman's been really um, proactive in in terms of uh, being or you know, trying to facilitate that with all the all the uh, mill manufacturers, and they've all been really cooperative, which is terrific to see. Um, It'd be great to see, uh, obviously, uh, some some options for um, red and yellow and light green machines in terms of uh, availability and and uh, just expanding the, the options for them. Um, uh, and yes, there's a gearbox attached, but uh, you know we didn't hear of any issues uh, with that uh, over the last harvest. Uh, onto the seed terminator um, uh, again. Pete's mentioned uh, the uh, the high flow. Um, slightly lower kill mill option there, which we think is a great thing. There's about 150 of these in, in, uh, in play last, as of last year. Uh, so certainly got um, some experience under their belt. Uh, very low, no load power draw. And what we're talking about there is the amount of power that this thing requires uh, to run without um, putting any material through it. So um, that's, uh, that's something that gives you a bit of an indication as to uh, maybe some design um, and then that's been taken into, into consideration. Um, what we like, uh, high kill rates, uh, swapping the mills out was, takes about 20 minutes, so it's a pretty quick process. Um, that said, uh, bypassing um, the sieve, uh, bypassing uh, the, the, the unit to assess uh, sieve losses is more complex and it may require um, power stalls, all sorts of stuff like that, uh, depending on, again, the machine it's installed on. Um, getting to the sieves is uh, again difficult, uh, depending on what uh, what machine you've got it fitted to, um, and there is a pretty expensive gearbox hanging off the side of it. So, um, yeah, I suppose uh, that said, um, yeah, very uh, very much a, a unit that has had a lot of uh, smarts put into it and a lot of uh, research and ongoing R and D. So um, uh, that's one of the things that we uh, quite liked about the uh, about the seed terminator. Uh, again, just uh, to round it out, um, we've got a, an image there of, uh, of a seed terminator mill, um, having done uh, quite a bit of wheat um, and having ingested a fair bit of uh, sand and gravel. And I know that because it was my brother-in-law who uh, yeah, gave that mill a fair, fairly hard time. So um, he suggested that I might like to drive the header next year instead of him. But, you know, I think it's a bit rough. So, yeah. Anyway. Um, that's uh, that's all I've got there uh, for you, Tom. Uh, if there's any any questions, perhaps. Yeah, Ben. If I um, just throw something else in there, uh, Seed Terminator, I think have gone to a new um, mill manufacturing process, and they're um, really happy with the wear rates they've got. They're thinking it could even potentially be a thousand hours for the screens. Um, but uh, they'll have to wait till this harvest is done to just find out how many hours they get out of them. And while we're on that, I was going to throw to Marnie again. I think um, ReadyCop have got a promotion out. Is that right about getting two harvests? Am I right? Um, Marnie, I'll have to let you explain that. Um, yeah, well, last year was uh, another testing year. We had some variations on the theme with the, the manufacturer of those faders and the rotors and we experimented with some different uh, tungsten carbiding processes um, some of them weren't overly successful um, and then on the other extreme it proved to be significantly successful so we're that confident uh, going forward that we with uh, with working with John Deere that we've offered a two-year guarantee that if uh, after that second season those mills don't don't make it they will be receiving replacement mills at no cost so um, I guess once we get them into harvest 2020 and some of those crops in Western Australia where we're shoveling more dirt in it than crop in some of those occasions, we'll certainly give them a bit of a test. Yeah, great. Thanks, Marnie, for clearing that up. Um, also, we've got Ben Merritt and Cam Taylor with us. Ben, they've both got vertical HSDs. Obviously, in the ideal world, we'd have um, representatives from each um, each of the different mills. but. Um, yeah, Ben, just wondering if you could share um, some of your experience with having the HSD last year. Yeah, so uh, our um, vertical mill did about 310 hours and we decided to not to replace the mill. So 
the plan is we'll go into this harvest and try to get another 100 hours out of it, find a rainy day and the case mechanic estimates about a day to change the mill over. Um, I probably uh, realise I have to learn a lot more about header setup and grain losses to uh, operate the mill correctly and um, yeah, it's just a learning process for us really. So. Pass it over to Cam. Um, yeah, so last year we uh, so ran the two machines. Um, both have worn around about the same amount. Um, so they ran over about uh, oh, 1,800 hectares each, uh, doing did about 300 hours each. Um, so they think they will get another season if we can run in the same as what we did last year. Um, so hopefully that is the case. Otherwise, yeah, we'll be probably replacing them on the back end of this harvest. So yeah, so hopefully we get through another season. Um, yeah, our, our soils aren't, aren't as sandy as the ones in WA, that's for sure. So yeah, in terms of dirt and those sorts of things, um, we're only, we're probably only uh, no, three, three to five percent lentils of a program as well. So we're not on the ground all the time. So yeah, probably makes a difference. Yeah. Thanks, Cam. And how did you go with harvest capacity with the mills? Yes. So we got the seventy two forties. Um, we ran those machines at one hundred and five percent for the whole of harvest. Um, so no, they, they they were probably limited um, in the end. But when when we did reach up to 100%, we noticed probably changes in harvest losses of a bit more rotor loss and those types of things. So we we've progressed from a nine series to an eight series to a seven series just because of those losses over time. Uh, we probably went for the seven series before uh, knowing that we we're going to fit the mills. Um, maybe we'd consider going back up to an eight series just so you're not running the machine at a hundred percent all the time everything's getting so hot all the time and maybe that was a cause of some of those those fires as well so yeah that, that's probably where we're sitting at the moment but it was thanks, a it, it was a massive year as well so yeah yeah mm. thanks cam yeah and just another point i know ben mentioned that the vertical hsd is ctf compatible and uh with three meter centers and so on but i was at your farm and the mules had just arrived and i think you, they turned up with the wheels uh rear wheels a little bit wider than three meters have i got that right yeah that was that was at our farm um mm. so so you can i think you can run them at at three meters but you've got to be very careful of turning uh we've just put them out we've just put them out uh past the three meter mark because we're not we're not um religious about our three meter centers but yeah we we just ran them out on the wider setting so we don't hit them when we turn thanks cam and what about you ben in terms of harvest capacity um and which model harvester have you got uh, we've got a case 82, 40, 45 foot macked on front and uh, I think my biggest trouble was I was harvesting yield, uh, wheat yields of 700 kilos to four tonne to the hectare last year and I probably wasn't able to load the header up to its full capacity and I think that was creating too much uh, loss out the back and uh, something that we'll be working on um, considerably this season. But um, yeah, I was sort of still learning and um, yeah, we're going quite slow for the yields that we're doing. Uh, engine load was about 70 to 90% on the header. I was probably a bit conservative being the first year with the mill. Um, but uh, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so Tom, I'll move back on to the rest of that presentation, will I? I don't know if Ben's got any final comments here. Before, uh, yeah, Ben White? Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, I think um, you know the the, the um, power and capacity issue is is definitely one to consider. And I think anyone who's looking at a mill um, probably needs to think about either going up a class to be, to accommodate that, or looking at um, you know remapping or chipping. And, and uh, anecdotally, um, there is differences in in performance between the various uh, chips or or, uh, or maps. Uh, and I've seen firsthand where uh, you know a map has, a remap has been applied. Um, and uh, and there's been no additional capacity out of the machine. So, you know, I think there's probably, um, uh, you know, th there's probably some food for thought in there and, and I'm not sure how that you test that uh, other than um, maybe uh, asking for, for a trial um, of, uh, of one of those products, if that's what you're going to do. I'm going to have a feedback story here, if, if you guys don't mind, um, about the middleware and, and harvest loss. Uh, we got a customer in Australia who was using the who was using a chaff card, and he spent the full season with the Bushel Plus system to get to know his combine, dial in his losses, and then the year after he switched to a he switched to a destructor unit, and then when he started the harvest, um, he was using settings and things that he, he knew already to reduce his grain loss, and then the 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 people came out and they were reckoned they had less wear, they saw less wear on the mills and they reckoned it was because he has, was putting less grain loss through the mills. Is that something that Pete and Ben that you guys have heard and, and seen out there as well? This, this is something that came straight from a farmer. Um, I, I, think, I think potentially one of the biggest issues is machine setup and um, and uh, you, you look, grain's probably part of it, but I actually think that the biggest issue is uh, is pushing uh, material off the rotor through the mills, and, and just making sure that, that that baffle of separation is 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 doing its job. Um, that's what tends to wear mills out a fair bit as well. Pete, what yeah. are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, yeah, agree with Ben, but also 100% Marcel. Um, grain going into the mills wears them out real fast, and especially lentils. <laughs> But um, yeah, so they lost grain, wears out mills. Um, also, just when you talk about chaff carts, I had one fellow call me up who bought a chaff cart and he said, hey, I've paid for my chaff cart in the first year. I said, how's that? He said, well, I was harvesting canola and I noticed I've got these big black dumps. And he realised how much grain he was losing out of the back of his uh, header all these years. And then he actually drove his harvester back through the chaff dumps and picked up something like 50 grand's worth of grain out of his canola chaff dumps. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just a funny little story. There was a, there's a question about, uh, which comes up 100% of the time I present about harvest weed seed control. And that question is about, are we selecting for prostrate weeds or early shedding weeds uh, when we use harvest weed seed control? And how long is that going to take? Well, firstly, um, we're not seeing any evidence of it yet. Possibly we've got some radish in Western Australia, which is early shedding. The prostrate growth habit um, certainly hasn't happened. There was some early stories. It's a, it's a good old urban myth, um, or rural myth in this case, from the Shields family uh, back in the 90s, where they saw some prostrate ryegrass, but it turned out that it was just ryegrass that was growing out on its own. And when you put a ryegrass seed in an area on its own, it grows prostrate to catch as much light as it can. So we've done common garden um, experiments. We haven't seen any prostrate um, ryegrass. We haven't found any shedding ryegrass yet. Uh, however, I was also talking to Ray Harrington about this. And when he's asked this question, he just says, yep, of course it will happen. We will definitely select for uh, early shedding weeds one day uh, and we will just deal with it. We will adapt and overcome. And that's just Ray's attitude to everything. Um, and uh, so, the answer is yes, it's a possibility. In my experience, what happens is farmers that use harvest weed seed control and other tools like in the Weed Smart Big Six, other things to run down their seed banks, they end up with such low weed seed banks that then they're putting very little selection pressure over their weeds because there are hardly any weeds in the crop, but they just keep the harvest weed seed control going to keep the numbers down. If you have weeds every year, and for example, the farmer with the early shedding radish in WA, I think, they have had uh, weed surviving herbicides. I think they potentially, um, you know, didn't, uh, weren't using the top level herbicides, if you know what I mean, and some other things. And so they were selecting radish every year and they selected for early shedding, is my understanding. 
So yeah, it can happen, um, but it's uh, not happening much at the moment. And if it does, we'll just ask Ray Harrington to come up with a solution again. <laughs> All right, I'll go back to my slides here, um, with back through to where I was. So that sort of finishes our, harvest, our discussion on the mills for now. Um, I'll just uh, move on. Hopefully you're seeing chaff lining now. Tom, let me know if you're not seeing that at the moment. Um, just some of the other some of the other harvest weed seed control tools. So chaff lining is another one. This is farmers just making a shoot, catching everything off the sieve, putting it into a chaff line and leaving it. So the straw is chopped and spread and the chaff just goes in a chaff line. It's not burnt, it's just left there. Uh, we put chaff line on chaff line on chaff line year after year. It doesn't have to be full CTF, but we'd like it if the harvester runs on the same tracks every year. Uh, it's not perfect, but it is a good low cost harvest weed seed control alternative. There's all sorts of different ways. This is a farmer at, um, at UNA that cut up an IVC, which is attached to the sieve and it shakes and then it drops into, a, into another shoot. This is Lee Bryan from Swan Hill who made tarp line, which is a PVC tarp and it shakes around and, and makes a chaff line and the shaking can clear it, I think. Uh, this is the commercial one from West Oz Boiler Making. They, they sell them. You can buy kits for all the different makes of Harvester. And you buy a kit. Good thing about buying their kit is you just know it's going to work. Um, and also West Oz Boiler Making, incidentally, are uh, making the prototypes of the um, weed hog. So, um, yeah, very good product that we have there. And we have the primary sale, well, the EMAR chaff deck, which is sold by primary sales, um, which is taking the weed seeds off the sieve and using conveyor belts to put them on the uh, permanent tram lines. I know we've got Ian Ruwalt with us um, today. Ian, you have a chaff deck. I just wonder if perhaps um, you might like to share a bit of your experience. I don't know if you need to share your screen, um, Ian, or whether you're just happy to talk, but I might stop sharing mine for a moment and just let you tell us a little bit about why, maybe why you chose your chaff deck and what your experience has been. Okay, yeah, thanks, um, Peter. Yeah, uh, well, two years ago when we changed combines, we, we decided we'd opt for that because we looked at the chaff mills, but they seem to have lots of issues and they've obviously improved in a long way, as we know, and I guess hopefully they'll get better. And so we run with the, uh, the chaff deck. And we found it to work really well. It's, um, it's not the ultimate, but it does, works well. We've got a few side benefits. Obviously, we have a, a bonus when the summer weed spraying, you get no dust when you're driving on the chaff, which is a bit of a benefit. Uh, they're pretty low cost to run and they're not much maintenance. Uh, so we found it work really well. So, yeah, and it obviously you know, it doesn't get 100% of the seeds, but it does a pretty good job. A few slides there that probably show that somewhere. How's that for you? So it's in an operation. Yep. So, yeah. So, we had, I mean, talked to a lot of growers and uh, we decided that would be a place to start. But, and um, yeah, that's where we're at at the moment. So, but down the track, we'll probably consider if these other systems get better and better um, going down that way. Yeah. Excellent, so, and I'm right, taking that you've got a fully matched tramline farming system, have you, Ian, to use the chaff deck? Yeah, we have. So we're on full tramline system right through on 12.2 metres. And, uh, yeah, so we always go back on those lines. And over a period of time, we, as you keep rolling over them, they become a pretty hostile environment for those weeds. Uh, on our sprayer, we do have the ability to up the, up the rates on those particular load. Put a couple of extra nozzles in, or we can actually, uh, with some systems, we can actually have increase the rate so just where you're doing that i guess down the track if we've got a really serious problem you could actually make it boom up with just nozzles on that area and run over that way too but uh, haven't got to that yet so. yeah and we have seen that we saw warwick holding develop that system he calls it weed mm -hmm. lining where he just sprays six nozzles over uh 120 feet i think and um sprays a higher dose of expensive herbicide on these um tram lines and then a cheaper herbicide over the rest of the paddock yeah, so it's certainly got, I mean, what used to often be an area, a problem area was in between the wheels. We're getting a lot of chaff and a lot of feet, so it's actually moving them out of that area, which is probably more important than, than wider out. Yeah. Yeah, and what are you seeing in terms of how weedy your tram lines are? Are they as weedy as you would expect, given how many weeds you're putting in there? Oh, uh, they are, yeah, but like I say, they don't, they're not growing that well in those areas. We do still sow them, but um, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, when you're doing tram lining, you're always going to lose some of those areas anyhow. Although, 
most of the cereal crops now are going to be difficult to see where they are, but it tends to show up more in the legume crops there. Yeah, thanks, Ian. If you've got any questions of Ian, um, yeah, I've got chuck them in the Q&A. If we could. Um, yeah, in terms of the decks, any blockages in heavy crops or uh, what, what issues are you having? Anything at all like that? Uh, yeah, look, we have blocked them. It, it's usually when you shouldn't be there. Yeah. Uh, it's either too damp or the crop's not, not really ready to be harvested there. So uh, mainly in canola, we get caught last year in some beans. We had to, to too much stuff in them and had to desiccate them. So, yeah. But other than that, generally, yeah. I guess there is another option that they offer. You can put another roller with it, which will help separate that, but we haven't then to use that. But I guess the same with all these systems, still got to be able to separate one from the other. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. We've got a question yeah, coming in here on the chat line. It's, Cam, you mentioned that you've got a, you've, your um, system has tried a number of different harvest weed seed control methods. Um, and Ben, I know you have changed your methods as well over the years. What was the impetus for you guys to go to a mill system over a, over a chaff line? Uh, we, we were narrow windrow burning for a long time um, in progression to see if the baffle would separate the chaff from the straw and keeping them and keeping the weed seeds in there just for our own confidence. That's why we probably went for the chaff line for a couple of years. Uh, we always wanted to get to the destructors and as soon as they came out with a vertical design we were pretty much straight into them. But just the, yeah, so the chaff line was sort of, well we went to Weed Smart up in Wagga, a group of us from our farm and we came back and we said oh what are we going to do? So we gave it a go. We sort of probably chopped and changed a little bit between the narrow windrow and the chaff line uh, just with some cement blockage um, with our we, we did our own design of our um, baffle in the back but yeah we haven't had any blockages with the with the one that's come with the disruptor so that that was our natural progression um, we we really seen a nutrient distribution like uneven distribution after years and years of you no know, wind road burning so we really wanted to get away from that and um, and yeah get into spreading that straw back over the paddock yeah thanks cam probably an impact with your uh just the environment down there as well cam don't you with chaff lines not breaking down as well yes yeah so so the chaff line itself uh so we just put the the one line out of the back of the header and our rotation is probably like a canola wheat barley and after you're putting those sort of material year after year on top of each other, if you're getting big years, it can become just pretty much a narrow windrow after those years. And it doesn't break down. The weed seeds are still there. You look underneath it. And yeah, that, if you get a wet spring though, then you can get germination of those seeds. And then you're getting, yeah, like harvest contamination issues and all those types of things. Yeah. And then, and then they harbour mice, snails, slugs, all those types of things as well. So when you're getting those types of issues, yeah, we're pretty pretty quick to jump over to the um, to the other system. Uh, yeah, but but splitting it into a chaff deck, I think, would have been a much better option over a longer time rather than the one row, and you and you're run, running over those rows as well, where we weren't running over the rows. So. That, that could be a better system. We're like Ian's system there, which farms in the same area. Ben, yeah, thanks, Ken. Are you for a bit, were you? <laughs> Sorry, I've lost you there. Sorry, what's the question? Hello? You're muted, Tom. Sorry, mate. Ben Merritt was windrow burning for a couple of years, I know, up in Ultima. What was the impetus of change? Uh, yeah, right. Um, yeah, we started in 2015, did a lot in 2016, but um, smoking out our uh, neighbours and the t next door towns and um, increased fire restrictions in Victoria just decided that um, the Harrington seed destructor or the mill was the way to go and 
we've incorporated that with our export oat and hay, which we've got really good ryegrass control now, um, brome grass control I'm very concerned about. We've got late germinating brome grass this year um, and windrowing wheat to try get the brome grass seed in the windrow to get it in the header is something that we're looking at this year. That's about it. Yeah. Ben, I'll cut you off a minute ago. Sorry, did you have something else to add? No, no. No, that's it. Beauty. So, Tom, I've got just, uh, we're at the end of our allotted time. I might just finish off with one or two last slides, if that's okay. Well, and probably just mention that, um, that those comments, a lot of people are doing the same thing. They are moving from often chaff lining to one of the mills and it's a fairly natural progression. Um, so yeah, really to just finish off with just, we've talked about all the other uh, tools. Hopefully we've got narrow windrow burning on the screen now. Narrow windrow burning, we're seeing disadoption of that uh, and probably for good reasons and nutrient redistribution is a big one. Fires getting away is another one, but it, uh, still a a useful tool in our lower rainfall zones for, for a lot of our farmers. But really we are seeing people either moving to chaff lining to get away from just having to do all the burning. or um, And then the other thing I was going to mention, Cam mentioned the chaff lines building up. Some people are doing chaff lines for a couple of years and then putting a canola windrow on top of it and burning that to, to sort of reset it. So there are some sort of low tech, lower cost uh, alternatives. but. When we look at the cost, we do have to consider those nutrients and windrow burning, if we look at the cost, particularly of potassium, uh, can be quite costly. And probably the last one to just finish up on is the chaff cart. Um, we still have chaff carts running around. Some people are using them and burning the dumps, but this is the, the big one now is integrating chaff carts with uh, mixed farms and livestock systems and grazing the dumps. Um, some really good figures from uh, Ed Riggle in Western Australia showing us that we can get really good growth of, of sheep and improve uh, sheep performance grazing chaff dumps over grazing just normal paddocks, um, particularly um, yeah, canola and barley and a range of crops really. Uh, and so the chaff cart isn't, um, isn't dead in the water if you like, it's still, still a tool that we see people using in mixed farm operations. And the final one, the Glenbar Bale Direct, um, is pretty rare, but there are farmers that use it and they use it generally to make more profit because they have a market for the bales. Uh, it does obviously do a very good job of cleaning up weed seeds, but if farmers have a market for straw bales close to the farm, uh, that can be um, uh, profitable. And my understanding is that um, Graham Shields is still inventing stuff and his latest invention is a PTO drive for these things, which has made it even better again. I haven't checked that out yet, but um, I don't know if Ben White has seen that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's still out there and, and people still innovating in that space. That's probably all from me, Tom. Thanks very much, Pete. Um, we are getting close to where we're gonna finish up, but if there's any further questions we've got to come in or between the growers and the presenters, uh, now's the time to sort of have that final wrap up. Um, I know Ben Merritt, when we spoke the other day, you were asking about um, different yielding paddocks, so in the same paddock with different yields, and and um, I had some queries around that for Marcel. I don't know if you want to back over that again for the benefit of the audience. Yeah, I was just asking um, about uh, gra grain loss setting up the header between um, Varying soil types, for instance, a low yielding crop in a flat and uh, yielding quite high on the rise and how do we uh, compensate and um, in the header and probably one of the things we're looking at is to get one of the automatic crop setting headers into the future. But for now, I think Marcel was saying it was speed is one of the main factors we can use. Um, yeah, what do you think, Marcel? Yeah, that, that is a great challenge that, that we're dealing with in a, in a lot of countries. And I, I think it's a great question. You you pointed out the future will be the self-setting 
um, systems there in the future that will certainly help you as the operator making it, it easier for you to adjust to those things. Again, um, it'll be interesting or it will be not interesting, it will be important then to measure your, your loss sensors in that lower yielding area, but then also in those high yielding areas. So create yourself those two benchmarks, making sure the, the sensors are picking up the right signals. Um, for, for now, you mentioned speed already. That's probably the, the best approach that you have at the moment, because if you imagine you set up your header for a high yielding area, you're most likely driving a higher, a larger concave gap because you're putting more crop through it. And then all of a sudden you're coming into an area with less crop. You can't fill that concave gap the same way. So instead of now starting to adjust your concave um, closing up, opening up all day long back and forth, which will just wear a driver right out. The, the easiest thing, let's say, would be your speed. So you're probably looking at a concave setting for kind of a, a lower, the, you're shooting kind of for the average of the area and then you would adjust with, with your speed. So in the lower yielding area, try to feed your combine more full and keep that, that grain to grain thrashing or the straw to grain thrashing up. And as you're in the higher area, uh, higher yielding areas, you'll be slowing down a bit to utilize still the, the, the straw grain or the grain on grain thrashing um, scenario in, in that case. But really, if, if you don't want to start changing sieves and concaves manually on the go, the speed is one of the main things to use with you have here as well. Uh, that's one of our main challenges. And then the, th the thing is too with the speed, it all starts at your um, header front. So you, you start feeding the crop correctly on the header front. They have to come in evenly, heads or pods in first. Doesn't matter if it's a draper header or an auger header. There is a couple of tricks to set them to feed it properly into your, into your feeder house. And it's especially important when you go in the high yielding area, low yielding area. That's where you may have to play even with your header angle a little bit with your reels um, in a way that you adjust to these type of crops, more straw, getting it into the combine. Because once you get lumps into the combine, into the feeder house or the crop goes in uneven, you won't be able to fix it in the back anymore. So once you feed uneven in the front, it's really hard for a combine to thresh it properly going through the machine once the feeding is, is uneven. Thanks, Marcel. I think we've probably hit the uh, hit the end of this session where we've gone over two hours and it's been really good. So I'd like to thank uh, all of you guys for contributing and helping to make this a, a good discussion. And hopefully our audience got something out of this as well. Um, we've got one question here from Russell Hunter who's just come in. Cam, do you use lifters in cereals? Uh, no, but it's something that we actually have talked about uh, doing and trying this year. Um, we found that the big cereal crops last year that caused the ryegrass just to lay flat on the ground and we couldn't pick it up with the header. We are just going straight over the top of it on the ground with a, with a flex front. So yeah, we, we were thinking that we might actually have to try something different. So yeah, it's something that we've talked about. Good on you, Cam. Um, if anyone has got any further questions, just feel free to shoot um, myself an email at BCG here and we'll, we'll get in touch with these project partners and, and get an answer back to you. And if we feel there's enough uh, questions to, to, for, to facilitate another one of these um, forums, we'll, we'll do so. And I'd like to thank particularly myself for staying up so late. I don't know what time it is over there now, Marcel, in Canada, close to midnight. I'm sure. We're good. We're good. Yep. So it's time to let you get to bed. Um, we'll thank GRDC as well for funding this um, forum as part of the Harvest to Set Up Clinic project that hopefully we'll be pushing ahead with next year and we are, we'll be running some face-to-face -face workshops in Victoria. Uh, God giving us the uh, opportunity to do that with some easy moving restrictions. Um, good luck to the, for the Harvest this year with everyone. I hope you've had something really good to think about. And like I said, get in touch if you need to and thanks to all the panellists.